And for those of you guys watching online from coast to coast and across the Fruited Plains, my name is Joe. I'm the pastor here at Lynchburg City Church. I am also the brigade chaplain at the 596 Transportation Brigade out of Southport, North Carolina. Ironclad surface warriors. And a shout out to our entire brigade and uh, to my colonel, my boss, Colonel Blackader, um, and the entire uh, team there at the 596. And just kind of like on a personal note, I want to wish everyone a happy Easter, of course, but I also want to say wherever you guys may be watching today, if you're going through something, if you're dealing with something, I'm here. I'm here. Say something. Uh, it has been a, a challenging year. We're only four months in, and I want you to know, like, you're not alone. You have support, and you can reach out to the brigade. They'll put you in contact with me. You can reach out to SDDC. They'll put you in contact with Chaplain Sullivan, the command, Chaplain Sedwick. And if, honestly, if chaplains aren't your thing, that's okay. No worries whatsoever. Um, talk to somebody. Talk to somebody. We say this all the time in the Army. There's, there's no room for lone rangers. And as a Christian, I believe that's like doubly true. Like God didn't make us for isolation by ourselves, especially when things get difficult, when things get hard. And so I'd encourage you to talk to somebody today. And with that, I want to go ahead and pray for us right now. Lord, we love you and we thank you uh, for living the life we could not live and dying the death we should have died and paying the price we could not afford to pay. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. And today, Lord, we think of the people in Ukraine, in Kiev, in Mariupol, in Kharkiv, in Kyrgyzstan, in Odessa, in Lviv. For Vladimir Putin, we, we pray, Lord, that you would confuse and frustrate his plans. We pray that the church there in the Ukraine and in Russia would shine brightly in the midst of the hurt and the pain and the suffering and the great evil going on right now. Lord, we think of our leaders for President Biden. Lord, I pray that you would guide him in all wisdom. I pray for a special grace in his life this Easter. I pray that you would protect his mind, his mental capacity, his health, uh, his physical body, Lord, that you would just watch over him and pour out your grace in his life, Lord. For my own commander, Colonel Blackader, Lord, I, I pray you'd give him wisdom and guide him, Lord. I pray for protection and safety for him and his family. And Lord, we think of the persecuted church right now. I'm thinking of Leah Sherabu being held by Boko Haram in Nigeria because she's a Christian. And Pastor Youssef imprisoned in Iran because he's a Christian. Pastor Wang and Pastor John in China for the Christians in North Korea and the South Sudan and in Nigeria. Lord, we remember those who are in chains as if in chains with them. God, help them. Jesus, help them. And Lord, we think of uh, all of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, coast guardsmen, those serving at home and abroad right now. We pray for their safety. And uh, Lord, we pray for their salvation. Many, many of those men and women, they, they don't know you, Lord, in a saving way. And I, I pray they would. I pray they'd come to know you. I pray you'd do a miracle in their life, Lord. And today, Lord, I need your help. Uh, protect me as I speak today. Protect me from error. Lord, don't let me say anything that I should not say. And Lord, I also pray for a fresh filling of the Spirit in my life. If there's something I need to say that I haven't even planned on saying, I pray that you'd give me a word today, Lord, that you'd guide me. And for, for those of us here or watching, I pray you just free us from distraction right now. Whatever, whatever we got going on, Lord, if you could just give us a moment of clarity. We want to hear from you. So help us. We need you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, once again, guys, uh, it's always an honor to get to be here, uh, especially for Easter. And happy Easter to every one of you. Uh, we are taking a quick pause in the book of Genesis. And uh, we shall, if God wills it, resume next week. But we are in the book of Revelation today. We are in the book of Revelation, not to be confused with Revelation, such a text does not exist, as my professor would always scold us when he would hear someone add an S to the end of the book. There's no S, just Revelation, just one. But here's the question I want to pose for you today. If you're taking notes, if you're not taking notes, I, I never can usually, I'm not a note taker, 
So like, I'm just like, just keep talking, right? So if that's, if you don't want to take notes, that's cool. But here's the question I want to pose for you guys today. The question I want to pose for you today is, why did Jesus Christ come to die? I don't know if you ever thought about it. But it's a really important question to ask. And a frequent answer that I get is, well, he died so that my sins would be forgiven. Because I need my sins forgiven so I don't go to hell. Because I don't want to go to hell. That's, that's not a false statement. It's not a false picture by, by any means. It's just not the, the whole picture. See, there are many, many reasons why Jesus Christ came to die. Many of them. Piper wrote a book, 50 Reasons Why Jesus Christ Came to Die. But what I realize for most of us in our biblically illiterate Disneyland version of American Christianity, the world we live in, we're aware of maybe like one or two of those things. So why did he come to die? That's the question that I, I hope we'll answer today. And I, I want to take us beyond just forgiveness of sins. I want to take us beyond just spending eternity with Jesus. I want this to be more than just your run-of-the-mill, happy-go-lucky Easter sermon that I've heard a hundred different times. And so we begin today in Revelation chapter 5. John here in Revelation 5, he's given a vision. He's given a vision of things that have not yet taken place. They're going to take place. They haven't taken place yet. They're going to in the future. And we begin in verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Here we are. We're in the throne room, right? There's someone on the throne. It's the first member of the Trinity. We know that from the backstory in chapter 4. Father God is on the throne. He's got a scroll in his hand. The scroll's got writing in it. The scroll's got writing on the, on the back side of it. Apparently the author had a whole bunch to say. And then the scroll is sealed with seven seals. Seven different seals. In Roman antiquity, within the first century, there is evidence that this is what you would do to establish the legality of a document. You'd have it sealed by each and every one of the witnesses. And so there he is on the throne, the Father, scroll in hand, writing on, inside, outside, seals on it. And it says in verse 2, And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming. She's a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? Who is worthy? Is anyone worthy? Come forward. John sees this mighty angel. He's, he's shouting. He's proclaiming. In fact, the, the, the Greek word for proclaiming right there is the same word used to describe preaching. It would correspond to someone in the first century who possessed an unusually good vocal instrument, something like a town crier who would come to visit your town or city to deliver an important message. Right? Town crier shows up, gets off his horse, and he says, Hear ye, hear ye! On the fourth day of this... The 17th or ninth month, there's not 17 months, nine months, in the year of our Lord, the emperor has declared X, Y, and Z, right? That's, that's the same word used to describe preaching here. So the angel here, he's proclaiming this message. And so a search begins. A search of the entire universe, every corner of the cosmos, all points in between, and it turns out, no one can be found. The proclamation goes forth throughout the whole universe and silence follows. No one steps forward. No one answers the call. Remember, there are countless thousands of angels hearing this proclamation, begging someone to come forward to open the, sc the scroll to break its seals. Countless thousands of angels they don't respond. Not to mention all the righteous dead throughout the ages. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Job, Moses, David, Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Peter, the rest of the apostles, Paul, all the other Christians throughout the church ages. No one responds. No one, no one responds to the angel's proclamation. Is anyone worthy to come forward to take the scroll? No one volunteers. 
No one raises their hand. No one speaks up. You might say the search is not going very well. And no one in heaven, verse 3, or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And at this point, John, he is emotionally exhausted. He begins to cry. And gentlemen, I don't mean like, oh, you saw your favorite movie, you know, and one of the characters died, you know, right? Like he's bawling his eyes out at this point. He, he has become emotionally involved with his own vision. John really wants to know. He wants to know what's in the scroll. But until the scroll is open, that's an impossibility to know what's in the scroll. And, and the way the Greek is written where it says he's weeping loudly, the emphasis is placed on the continuation. It's not like a one and done thing, him crying. He's just crying and crying and crying and crying. The longer the search goes on, the more futile the search becomes the more deeply John weeps. Because until the scroll is opened, God's purposes remain not merely unknown, but they remain unaccomplished. So you have to understand this about this guy, John, who's writing this. John's been brought up on this messianic hope of the Old Testament. And and there's this promise, right? And the promise is one day God is going to assume his kingly power and reign openly on earth. And and that hasn't happened yet. Hasn't happened. Remember when Jesus came the first time? They thought he was going to be something else. They thought he was going to be this conquering hero. And he wasn't. He was the suffering servant. But John knows, he knows that one day he's going to come back. And he yearns for that day. He looks forward to that day. The day when the wicked will be punished and, and the wrongs will be made right and justice will prevail. Especially in the midst of the persecution of God's people. He's longed for that day for which Suffering will come to an end, and the faith of the faithful will be vindicated. And now, now it seems to John that that day, that day that he's so looking forward to, that it's been indefinitely postponed. And so there he is. He's weeping loudly. He's just crying and crying. And it's worth noting, this is the only time in Scripture where tears are seen in heaven. Only time. Only time. And so John, he's, he's weeping because he yearns to see the world free of evil, free of sin, free of death. And what has he seen up to this point? I mean, he's writing this story around AD 95. He's believed to be the last surviving apostle. But, but think about what he's seen. He's discipled by Jesus. He witnessed his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. He knows he's coming back. And they go week after week, month after month. Year after year. Another year? Is he coming back? Next year? Is he coming back? No, John. Not this year. Not this year. You know, one of my, one of my favorite songs, one of my favorite songs I love to sing is, uh, is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And most people think of that song as a Christmas song. It is so much more than that. It's this beautiful, haunting masterpiece with lyrical depth that few other songs manage to have in contemporary Christianity. But here's the thing. In in that song, we're not simply role-playing with the ancient Israelites, what they must have felt and prayed for before the coming of Messiah, but more than that. See, in that song, our hearts are united in hope and in longing. When we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, we yearn forward to when we, when he would come again. When he would come again. That's what John's feeling in this moment. He, he, he wants him to come. All of his buddies have been killed. He's the last surviving apostle. Most likely, right, at this point. And he just... He just wants Messiah to return and come. That's why he's upset. He wants to see Satan vanquished. He wants to see God's kingdom established on earth. He wants to see Israel saved and Christ exalted. And what's he seen? He saw his Messiah executed. He saw Jerusalem destroyed by General Titus in 70 AD. He saw the Jewish people massacred and scattered. The church facing persecution from within and without, dealing with different types of sins. I mean, you just read Revelation chapter 2 and 3. They're a hot mess. 
As I said, his friends, they've all been killed, martyred. It's believed John, the guy writing this, the only apostle who did not live to die a martyr's death. You begin to understand, oh, that, that makes sense why he's crying, right? That makes sense. Because maybe that's how some of you feel right now. The world seems like it's upside down. You never thought you'd ever have to worry about this thing called inflation. That was something that happened 40 years ago. And you turn on the news and you see how the people of Ukraine are being unjustly treated. You see wicked rulers who are moving unchecked. You see a president who just desperately needs our continued prayers. Not to mention all the personal suffering and pain and hurt that some of you have experienced this last year. And it feels maybe like you can't catch a break. And you begin to understand, yeah, that makes sense why John's crying. He longs for the return of the king. And so the proclamation goes out, and no one responds. He's crying because they've searched the entire universe, and they can't find anyone to take the scroll, to break its seals, to open it up. He's crying because it seems that God's actions appear to be indefinitely postponed, and he's just tired of waiting. He's tired of waiting. Waiting, waiting, waiting. All I ever do is just wait. I know no one in here struggles with waiting. Verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he could open the scrolls and its seven seals. Suddenly John's sorrow is interrupted by one of the 24 elders. The identity of the elder, it's unknown. There's John, he's crying. The elder comes over. John, John, stop crying. John, he's a hot mess, right? Going through Kleenex probably, whatever. He's crying, he's crying. John, John, stop. It's okay, John. John, we found someone. We found someone to open the scroll. It's okay, John. It's it's okay. And so, verse 6, it says this. And between the throne and the four living creatures... And among the elders, I saw a lamb. There he is, right? He's getting the tears out of his eyes. He's like, is that a lamb? That's a lamb. I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with... That's interesting. Yeah, you saw it too, I can tell. Seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. It's clear this is not an ordinary lamb. There's a lamb, it's standing there, looks like it's slain, it's not, it's alive, it's been, looks like it's slain though, then it's got seven horns and seven eyes, you say, what does it look like? I don't know, I've never seen that. Don't know, but here's my best attempt to to break down what we're seeing. First, the the horn, not trying to get all like, insert like a bunch of spiritual meanings here, all throughout scripture, the horn is symbolic for strength for power, for courage. And that kind of makes sense with this whole picture of a lamb that's alive that looks like it's slain. Uh, Because this lamb, as I said, it's not an ordinary lamb. This lamb has triumphed over death. Right? It's Easter. There's the connection, right? No surprise, right? No surprise. But then it's got seven eyes. That's kind of strange. One commentator notes that... John might be borrowing from Zechariah 4 uh, as, as a reference here to the seven eyes, as a reference to its omniscience, which makes sense, but he goes on even further. Those eyes, John noted, represented the seven spirits of God, because he tells us, right? He says, it's got seven eyes, and we're like, what's seven eyes? And he says, oh, they're the seven spirits of God sounded into all the earth, and we're like, oh, okay, that's clear as mud, right? Thanks, John, for the explanation. He, he helps us a little bit in, in John Uh, Excuse me, in Revelation 4 and 5. I don't have it on the screen, I'll just read it for you. Here's what he says in Revelation 4 and 5. From the throne came flashes of lightning and and rumblings and pearls of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. In Revelation 1 4, it says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits 
who are before the throne. This phrase, the seven spirits, which Sean explains, that's the connection between seven eyes and seven spirits, is a reference to the Holy Spirit in all its fullness as it goes out throughout all the earth. Bottom line, we have a very Trinitarian scene here. We've got the Father on the throne holding the scroll with the seven seals, with writing inside and outside. And then we have this Lamb, which is representative of Jesus, right? And then we have the Holy Spirit. Very Trinitarian scene. The Lamb is there, not an ordinary Lamb, powerful, strong, all-knowing, and it's standing there, alive, but it looks like it's slain because it's triumphed over death. And it's there to open the scroll. And that's good news. Verse 7. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. There is a significant and stark contrast worth noting, especially if you read Revelation 4. Revelation 4, everyone's just bowing down and worshiping the first member of the Trinity sitting on the throne with a scroll in his hand, right? And here the Lamb walks over, takes the scroll from his hand. He's got no need to bow down to the one on the throne. And John seems to see the Lamb as just as much as God, as the one who is on the throne. And so he takes the scroll the details of which are in chapter 6 to 8, if you want to read ahead later on. He takes the scroll, and as soon as he takes the scroll, look what verse 8, and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. They fell down. They've got a harp in one hand, they've got golden bowls full of incense in the other hand, which are the prayers of the saints. The Lamb takes the scroll, and there is this heavenly celebration that just erupts. Heavenly celebration. This explosion of of song and worship as they all bow down to worship. They got this harp in one hand. They've got the golden bowls full of incense, which John says, the golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Don't, Don't you think that's interesting? I thought that was interesting. Like when you pray, Christians, those are your prayers, right? They are sweet and pleasant aromas to the king on the throne. Sometimes you might wonder, like, does he hear my prayers? He smells your prayers. Maybe you didn't think of that before, right? It's like, oh, I didn't know he just smelled. Yeah, there it is. He says, it's like incense in a golden bowl, which are the prayers of the saints. And so now the the ultimate goal of redemption is about to be seen. I posed the question at the beginning. The question I posed at the beginning of the sermon, why did Jesus Christ come to die? Why did he come to die? That's about to be answered, at least one of the many reasons. This spontaneous outburst of worship as the Lamb takes the scroll from the one on the throne results from the realization that the long anticipated defeat of sin, defeat of death, and Satan, it's about to be accomplished, and the Lord Jesus about to return to the earth and triumph and establish his glorious kingdom. That's good news. That is. That's good news. Verse 9. It says this, and they sang a new song. They sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed. Key word, ransomed. I just circled it because it's a key word. You ransomed people for God. You might not think for is important. I circled that too. It's important. You ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. The worthiness, I want to be clear here, the worthiness of the ransom people here is predicated on the fact that this lamb has been slain. Only reason. That the worthiness of the ransom people is predicated on the fact that the Lamb has been slain and has purchased salvation through His blood. From every tribe and language and nation, right? Every ethno-socioeconomic group. Love it. Beautiful. And a lot of people get it confused. I notice this. A lot of people get it confused when Jesus came the first time. He came as a lamb, led to the slaughter, as a suffering servant. But to be clear, he, He came to purchase us. He came to ransom us. That's why he came to die. That's the answer, right? The answer we're discussing. Why did he come to die? He came to purchase us. He came to ransom us. In fact, that the word purchase, go back to verse 9 if you wouldn't mind. The word purchase, the word ransom, right? It's, it's this really, really rich New Testament word that draws this beautiful picture of a slave market. 
the slave market. An ugly scene, to be sure, but beautiful nonetheless by the fact that they're about to be ransomed and purchased. The answer to the question that we started with is at the cross, Jesus Christ purchased. He ransomed with his own blood men and women from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, right? Think slave market with all its ugliness. And that's the point. He didn't just die to make salvation possible. He didn't. He died to do something more than just make it possible. And that is to secure it. He, do, he doesn't just go to the slave market and say, Hey, slaves, if you don't want to be a slave anymore, just stop being a slave. Right? Sounds like a positive, you know, prosperity gospel idea, right? More positive thinking, that's all you need. He doesn't, he doesn't say that. He doesn't go to the slave market and say, if you, don't want to, if you want to not be a slave anymore, just stop being a slave. Imagine how condescending that would have sounded, right? Like, in shackles, right? you got to be kidding, right? You think, you think if I wanted to keep being a slave, I would? Yeah, thanks a lot for the announcement. That's what really, I think, was a huge misconception within Christendom today. That Jesus Christ came to die on a cross to make salvation possible. He didn't die to make it possible. He died to secure Ransomed. He purchased. And let me be clear, not a drop of the Savior's blood was wasted. Not a single drop. Not a drop. He died for us who were slaves to sin, as the Scripture would tell us. That's why understanding this reason of why he came to die is just so, so important, so meaningful. I mean, you go back to when John was a younger guy, when he wrote the Gospel of John in John 8, 36. He says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We sang a song about that earlier. If he sets you free, if he sets you free, we need him to set us free. We need, some of you guys, maybe you have unsafe friends and family member like I do. What do they need? They need to be set free. They need to be set free. They're blind right now. They can't see. They need to be set free because we were all slaves to sin, slaves to death, slaves to our enemy. I mean, how remarkable when you think about how, what this must have been for John to witness. I mean, how thrilling, how exhilarating the realization for John that the redeemed world would one day include people from all over the world. Most of the people who are Christians, right, at this time, they're Jewish Christians. This is going to be like, what, what, you're saying what? From every tribe and nation? People that don't look like me? People that don't talk like me? Yep. Them too, John. Them too. Like, in John's day, the church was small, and it was isolated, it was, it was struggling, it was sinful. And John, he must have been concerned about its future, especially because five of the seven churches, as I said earlier in the first Chapter 2, chapter 3, Revelation, they were dealing with pretty serious, potentially fatal problems. But for John to know that persecution, to know that sin would not extinguish the spreading of Christianity, I imagine that was the effect, right? Not to mention joy and hope and peace to the apostle's heart. Joy and hope and peace to the apostle's heart in knowing this. I imagine some of you guys could go for some joy and peace and hope. Maybe a little extra today. I imagine, especially when you see all the injustice. You look on the news. I look on the news. I don't know if you watch the news. I do. And you see it. And every week, we pray for Ukraine. And you see images, people with their hands and arms tied behind their back executed in the streets. I mean, these are civilians. These aren't even like members of the military. Just executed. It's like a scene out of a movie, except it's real. And that's, that's just one picture. One of many of the injustices that occur. There's many others that you don't see, like in North Korea, or the South Sudan, or Nigeria. You know, last year in 2021 in Nigeria, in the first 200 days, 3,462 Christians were murdered. It's estimated by some organizations that by the end of 2021, 8,000 Nigerian Christians were murdered. That's 21 a day. That's almost one an hour. Like, one more 
person's going to die before I'm done preaching this sermon in Nigeria. No one talks about them. 8,000! Last year! It doesn't pull well with the politicians. Ukraine does, right? Ukraine pulls well. See the images? There's a whole lot of images that we don't see. They're happening every single day. Every single day. See, the truth is, is whether it's Ukraine or Nigeria or North Korea or the South Sudan, the people of God are suffering and it's gut-wrenching. It's gut-wrenching! You turn on the news, you see it every week. And you think back to the story. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy to open the scroll. And yet for many of us, when we think about why Jesus came to die, we're like, yeah, whatever. I've heard that story before. Whatever. Boring. Boring. You don't care. Shouldn't be like that. Like hearing the things we just heard today should make a difference in our life. You know, people ask the question, did Jesus come to die for us or for himself? I don't know if you've ever thought about that question. Did he come to die for us or for himself? Can you go back to verse 9? We're already on verse 9. Did he come to die for us or for himself? Some of you are like, that's a trick question. I know. It is. The answer is yes. You say yes? Right there. You ransomed people. I told you four was the key word. That's why I circled it. For God. I never saw that before. Big thanks to Mr. Piper, who about ten years pointed that out to me. God died for God. How did I grow up in the church my whole life? I never heard that. A lot of things I didn't hear growing up in the church, unfortunately. We were ransomed. We were ransomed. You were a slave to sin. You were a slave. Should make a difference, right? You're like, he ransomed us. Yeah, okay, whatever. For so many Christians, it doesn't make a lick of difference. And yet, here's what Peter says. Peter says, like, knowing this should, should bring some massive truths into your life. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for, key word, his own possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. And for many people, we spend more energy proclaiming things that just really don't matter all that much compared with that stuff. That matters. Let me put it in perspective. Because sometimes it's helpful to say when we're talking about why Jesus came to die by explaining why he did not come to die. A lot of misconceptions. So I figure it's a good time to address them. He didn't come to die to make your life easier and more comfortable. Didn't. You know, people talk about being blessed. They like to throw hashtags around. You know, the word blessed is used 112 times in the New Testament. 112 times in the New Testament. Do you know not one time does it refer to material prosperity or wealth? I didn't know that. Not a time. He didn't come to die so that you don't have to change, so that you could live your best life now. I always point that out. If you're here to live your best life now, as some Christian Bible teachers will say in air quotes, because I'm not sure if they're Christians always, the only way that's possible is if you're going to hell. Only way you can live your best life now is if you're going to hell. He, he bought you. He purchased you. He ransomed you. You were a slave. And many of us are like, yeah, whatever, that's nice. Next. Doesn't mean jack for so many Christians today. Like, he didn't come so you can just kick your feet up and like ride this out until the clock's over. Jesus didn't come to die so he could be the poster boy for your social justice campaign or your political party. Democratic or Republican. It's not why he came to die. And here's what you need to understand. If you want true change, people say, oh, I want, I want true change. That's great. It happens when God changes rebel hearts, not when a political candidate gets elected. Those political candidates will always disappoint you. They always will. And furthermore, the gospel is change. Now, how does that happen? Well, John says, because we found somebody to come who was worthy to open the scroll, to break its seals, to ransom people from every tribe and every nation and every language. And that's, that's really, really good news. And, that, and only that news brings real and lasting change. 
You were bought with a price. So do you not know that, brothers and sisters? You're not your own. Oh, that we might live lives that Peter would be proud of, proclaiming the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness. So as the team comes today, I want to pray for us. Lord, we love you so, so, so much. Lord, to think of all the many, many reasons why you came to die for us. And today, as we look at the fact that you came to die to buy us, to purchase us, to rescue us, to redeem us. I pray that that will be meaningful, Lord. I pray we won't just sit on our knees ignoring that truth, but we will want other people to know that truth. And we will open our mouths and take that and proclaim that to others. And Lord, Lord, I pray you'd come soon, Lord. I pray you'd come soon, Jesus. We look at it and we see all the hurt and we see all the pain and we see all the suffering in this world. And Lord, we celebrate that you conquered sin and death, Lord, but come back soon, Jesus. We long, just like ancient Israel, for you to return, for the king to return and to right all the wrongs, to bring true and lasting peace. Come soon, Jesus. Please come soon. We pray this in your name. Amen.